Pop up out of bed. Put my apron on. Wedge the clay. Yeah. What's up? How about that right there? Is that good? That's the I didn't get a haircut hat. Do you like that? With the apron and the kind of blue aesthetic I have going on here, I feel like. Get off my lawn. So this episode's gonna be a bit more fun because I realize that I am very, very bad at recording things that I personally find impressive while we are in season of the flex. For example, when I go to my nine to five job where I teach people in a classroom, I often end up at the end of the month giving them a lot of free time to kind of digest a lot of the content I've given them because I give presentations and I give demonstrations and things of that nature. But for some of the more advanced classes, I show them a demo, they go, oh, that's nice. And sometimes there's like five people in the class. So I get left with a lot of time to myself, which means that I open up my sketchbook and I try and create something like this or like this. And I like stuff like this. I love creating stuff like this. It gives me a creative outlet to get rid of that angst that I get when I'm creating little cups and bowls all day because ultimately that's what sells on Etsy. Not that I have an Etsy, that's just kind of what sells regardless of where you sell things anyway. So today we're gonna make an effort to create something that I actively want to create from the sketchbook. No, you can't see inside my sketchbook, you're just gonna have to watch the video. Honestly, that's the crazy thing because what happens is I wanna create something and I don't feel like doing it when the camera's on half the time because I wanna do it when I'm inspired to create things. But turning a camera on every morning and trying to create things on purpose isn't really driven by inspiration. It's just driven by creating content for you. This just happens to be one of those times where the two axioms meet, where I feel inspired and I want to create content for you at the same time. Damn, are the arms getting big though? Oh my God, let's, I'm sorry, it's, the video's not. So I bought 25 pounds of sculpture clay and we're gonna use all of this on the wheel at one time. I hate that they child proof these things. They're not even child proof, they're like Dante proof. Like there's a dude who works there and he's like, I know Dante's coming to get clay tomorrow. Put the brass tie on to make it hard for him. Feels good. Feels soft. Feels nice. <coughs> So here is the thing that I'm trying to create. The basic idea behind the form is to create a very, very large moon jar, cut out two sides of it in kind of an angle like this, and then score and slip the inverse of those two sides into each other. And it doesn't make much sense until you look at this form, which I previously made in class. This is pretty much just an egg-shaped vase where I cut off one side of it, or at least like two-thirds of one side, I turned it around and I put the inverse on it and then I made three little concentric holes on the inside of it. But I want to put it through the bisque in my KMT 1027 behind me. I this know, means that it can't be more wide than the kiln itself and I need about an inch or so in finger space to put down there. Trust me, that extra inch matters. So this thing is going to be large, but it can't be larger than the inside brick width of my kiln. Oh my god, I can't believe he doesn't know the width of the inside of his kiln, you say as you have a junk drawer at home where you definitely don't know everything that's inside that drawer. Yeah, that, that's about it. Which means I can't really make this thing over like 25 inches wide. You have a rest because I'm going to abuse Help you Help me. So we're gonna throw 25 pounds of clay on the wheel and it is sculpture clay and we can't go over 25 inches wide. I don't know how big 25 inches is. Is it like this big? Is that 25 inches? No, that's, that's six inches. I know for sure that's six inches.
Okay, I think that's pretty good. I didn't get the height that I wanted, but we are making something more wide than we are high. But at this point, I've done three pulls. For me personally, three pulls is kind of the maximum that I do before I'm like, eh, that's as much height as I've gotten. So now I need to stretch this out, which means I'm gonna put my hands on the inside and push out as I guide it from the outside with my tiny little rib right here. And keep in mind, I think from your point of view, this doesn't look large, but this is about the size of my entire forearm in height. To boot, I'm technically not done forming it yet. I am gonna collar it up. So it might even go past the camera point right now. That's not bad. This is generally where I'd like to start from my larger forms. Now I just have to hope that this clay isn't so short that it ends up breaking on me as I'm gonna have to stand up. I need to get to the bottom and my forearm, yeah, I have to stand up. Boys only want love when it's torture.
following Thursday. So now, I'm gonna take my spray bottle and kind of apply moisture to it as I, as I continue to throw. But what I've done now is I've made the mouth a tiny bit smaller, and in making it a tiny bit smaller, I've made it look more round. So our mouth used to be like right here, and now it's right here, right? Later. That's pretty good. I'm actually really happy with this. And I, I think from the camera's point of view, this doesn't look as big as it is. And I definitely kind of thought it would be larger because I thought using 25 pounds would gain me that many inches, but I'm not used to working with this clay. This is the first time I've ever worked with this type of clay. But just as kind of a barometer to size, here is the regular old Shimpo revolvey thing that almost everyone uses for a lot of their stuff, right? Just as a size comparison, this is essentially how big it is in comparison. So it's, it's much larger than it seems on screen, but it is definitely not as large as I wanted it to be. I was always taught to make at least three lids for one, to see which one fits better, and secondly, to see which one looks better. But I've kind of gotten out of that habit since I went to college for pottery. So I generally just kind of make one now with an extra big lid at the very bottom with plenty of clay to trim off so that I can reform it later on. I know that the curve of the pot is going over and downwards from the top. So I made the top look like it goes over and downwards from the top. I'm gonna remeasure it one more time. It is a little bigger 
than this here, which is kind of what I want, just because I want to make sure that if it's too big, I can just trim a little bit off. But if it's too small, I have to make a whole new one. So I always make one that's a little bit bigger than it needs to be. Now these two need to rest. Usually I would make a sculptural piece on top, but I'm gonna let this rest for one day. It feels like one day. We're gonna trim the bottom and then we're gonna start cutting into this. I can tell this isn't ready to trim because I can still just kind of like take off chunks of clay from this. It doesn't need to be this wet, but it does need to be dry enough for me to trim it safely. So we're gonna wrap these two things up and we're gonna come back tomorrow letting it go through another stage of drying. A little longer than a few minutes later. Okay, now let's check on the pot. It's been about two days. This sponge that has survived <laughs> World War III. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, but now that I've trimmed it and it's on a chuck and it, I've put my maker's mark at the bottom of it and everything and there's trim scraps 
all over the ground. Now you can actually see how big this pot is. And granted, it will shrink like 8 to 10% because it's sculpture clay. It has lots of grog in it. It won't shrink as much as porcelain. But it is still a pretty big pot. Furthermore, and I don't know if anyone's caught this, I didn't put any clay in between the attachment of the pot and the chuck itself. This is how I trimmed it the entire time. In fact, I think I can just lift it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you see that, but there, there was never any clay here to begin with. Of course, there's clay on the bottom down here to attach this to this, but we had literally nothing holding this up the entire time we were trimming it. I don't think many people think about it, but you truly do lose a lot of weight. So even if you're throwing something like 25 pounds, technically speaking, all these little bits of clay here add up to such an amount that you're, you're essentially losing like probably five pounds off of a very large piece like this. Here's just some of the trim. This is all clay. If I bundle this up into my hand, this is like two handfuls of clay. That's probably like two pounds right there, maybe even one and a half pounds. So that's quite a bit of clay. Okay, the lid fits like a glove and it comes off and on freely. Not only does it not move very well when it's stuck in there, which is perfect, that's what we want, a well-fitted lid. It also has a very, very good attachment point so I can take it on and off as I please. Now this is the difficult part coming up next. I need to cut a giant hole in this side here, cut a giant hole in this side here, inverse the shape and then score it, slip it, tie it back together, wait for it to dry a little more make the top sculptural part and then let it dry a little bit more while adding some different things on the inside of the inverse. It looks kind of like a concave form. So I got this bowl and we're going to use this as a cheap version of a guide for what we're going to do on the inverse of this. And that's pretty easy because the first cut, we just have to make a circle. The second cut though over here has to be measured. Now I need to extend this a little bit more. The key to this really is to make sure the clay is just wet enough to where it doesn't crack underneath the pressure of what I'm doing to it right now, which it's not, which, which is actually really good because if it did, then I would have to wrap this up, make sure I have the appropriate amount of scoring and slipping and create a whole other piece from a fresh piece of clay from the back. And that's usually way more wet than this. You usually want 
And generally speaking, I like to have my clay be the same amount of dryness so that when I attach them, they attach fairly well and they dry in the same rate. Whenever I inverse a form like this and I try and concave it, I usually use more clay than I actively need. So I will do two things, okay? So I squish it down a little bit. You saw me do it with the rolling pin earlier. And I'll usually try to leave more clay on the edges than I need. This is for two reasons. Number one, I make sure that I hit the edges correctly. And number two, if there's any excess clay, that I do actively not need, I can just cut it off with this tool here, like this, and this makes it seem far more accurate. But if I don't leave extra clay, I don't, I can't do this, right? I can't size it to its own hole if, if it doesn't have any, uh, any clay left.
we have one half of this done right here. And this sculptural part is essentially broken into thirds. So this is one third of it. If I can pull this off again on the other side, which is this side, we'll kind of have this, this thing that comes in twice. And then we can put a design inside of here. I'm gonna let this cure for a little bit because it needs a little bit more work. On top of that, I have not slipped the inside. So I do need to take a relatively long brush like this, look inside of here and touch up the inside just to make sure that it sticks fairly well. I can now make sure that this bowl fits this portion here and fit it to the edge of this. And as long as I make sure that it's relatively symmetrical on both sides, this should be what it is. So I don't know if you can see it, but I don't have enough clay to reach over here, but I have enough clay to reach over here. I can squeeze this together and make this into one thing like this if I choose to, you see. But this over here, I can't really do that. I don't have enough clay to do that with this piece, which is usually why I widen these pieces out. So you want to do this in a stage where you have enough clay, especially wet clay, to where you can take another piece of clay that is relatively wet and do something that we call additive sculpting. So you can take, this is fresh clay, you can take this clay and kind of put it here after forming it to whatever you need it to be. And this can act as kind of like a filler. I can do this and trim it off as I need So this is as far as I'm willing to take it right now. This is pretty good. We threw this, we made the lid, and it, I could tell this is a little bit off, like the tiniest bit. If you look really closely, this is slanted out a little more than this is, but that's just because this is the newest side and I haven't done as much treatment on this side as I have on this side. So as I slowly am scraping away, I'm digging further and further into the clay body. As for this over here, I'm just kind of letting it go because it looks finished enough. I just did a better job on the second go around but I did more work on one side than I did the other side. So as I move into this, this will probably end up being from this angle to like this angle right here and it'll look a little bit better. But I will say, this is pretty damn good. Is this pretty good? I do need to let this rest now though and spray it down with water because it is 100 degrees outside and uh, I need to let this kind of cure for lack of a better term and let everything stick together as I score it and slip them. And then we're gonna make the top sculpture to this portion here probably make it kind of an arc down here at another point. I'm thinking of kind of like a bangerang or a type of 
uh, machete bent downwards type shape. But we do need to let this rest because I've pushed the clay body pretty far today. Later that same evening. Well, good morning. Well, we've let this piece cure for, I want to say about a day and a half now. That's not bad for eyeballing this with a literal bowl. So here's the fun part for me. This angle, or at least these angles that make these curves right here, are not completely lined up. I don't need them to be exact because I can see that this is a little bit over. But this curve here, and I don't know if you can see it, is a little bit off. This is not a straight curve. It goes here, there's a bump here, and then it goes back in. So I need to take my metal rib and I need to kind of push this back in while the clay is still soft enough to be uh, morphed in some way. And every time I do this, I end up taking a little bit of clay off and that's what's making it a little more straight every single time. So I need to do that on both sides little by little. Something that I like to use and that I've been using for years are these cookie cutters. And I don't think a lot of people realize how well put together the world is until they get into craft because you start to notice these little things that really matter in craftsmanship, even things that are mass produced like these. These are basic cookie cutters and they have a bunch of different rings. I've been using them for a very long time. But you don't really realize how well put together they are because I use these specifically because they have measurements on them, number one, so I can kind of measure my stuff out. And number two, part of the side is rolled over. So this side doesn't cut me no matter how hard I put it on my skin, right? This side is not rolled over, so it does cut you much like a cookie cutter. So if I push this into clay and turn it around a little bit, this in fact will cut into clay. As for this side, it won't. I know some of you right now are like, no duh, Dante, that's how cookie cutters come. But you would seriously not believe how many cheap, low-end, Amazon, just somebody put them in a 3D printer real quick. Cookie cutters don't have this design of a thick part and a thin part. They often have two thin parts or two thick parts. So just having this simple tool right here really helps me cut through my artwork because I don't wanna do all that extra stuff.
considering that I've only measured like twice because I kind of freehanded the middle and then decided where this one goes, which is about an inch from the edge of this to this, and then I measured just an inch across from this to this, and I only measured once each time, I think it turned out pretty good. I will fully admit it 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 does kind of look like a Wally face TV now. Wally. Now before we move on, I want to explain that I need to smooth these out much like the rest of the form. The rest of the form is is I wouldn't say smooth, but nice and round, and even the edges are nice and round. And these here, you can tell, have been freshly cut. They stick out like a sore thumb. These edges here, we can't leave these this way. But I also can't take a sponge and just jam my finger in this hole and go in and out and around and around and do one of those. So I actively have to get something lighter or a brush to smooth these out, which we're gonna do right now. This is good. I like this. We threw the vase, we made it in proportion, we made sure the bottom was nice and trimmed, we made the holes, we sculpted this inside out, we made the lid, and the lid fits very, very well. Actually, I mean tremendously well. The final thing we need is the ornamental top that I like to put on many of my larger sculptural pieces. My issue is, I didn't plan out what I was supposed to make for the top. I just was kind of hoping that like, real Jesus would come down and be like, oh, here you go. Here's, here's some inspiration for you, but he's, I, I guess he's busy. I do have somewhat of an idea of what I want to make for this sculptural top, but I need a couple of things. Number one is space, some wood, a rolling pin, and some clay. And because this is strictly ornamental, and I know it's gonna survive, I don't have to make it super even, so I don't have to do that thing that you see on Instagram all the time, when people put like two rulers of the exact same size on both sides, and they rolling pin it to make sure it's exactly the thickness or thinness they want it to be. I don't, I don't really care about that. This is sculpture clay. I know it's gonna survive. No one's eaten off this. So I can make sure that this is artistically what I want it to be without having to fuss with it too much. I think I figured out what I want, and I think I figured out how we can get it. So firstly, I had to make it long enough, but not too long to where it touches the sides of the pot itself. So what we're planning on doing is we're planning on making something that arcs it downwards and goes with the form, like this, but if it goes too far out here, it's gonna mold down in the cone six kiln. The heat's gonna take it down a little bit, so I have to put it high enough, right? Or I have to let it rest on the base enough to where the structure can hold it up. That means it just can't go too far out because it'll it'll bend, right? Secondly, it can't touch this. It'll be sealed forever, which isn't a bad idea. It's not like this is meant to be opened ever. And if you want to put something in there, I mean, there's plenty of holes. But the key takeaway from this is, is that I need to make this structurally sound. So I figured out I can't make it flat, otherwise it'll just morph. So I need to make it relatively round. Okay, so I think I got it here. I'm gonna put this here, and this is, I think that's almost done. Now the last thing I need to do, because this is supposed to be the piece that ties it all together. It ties together these sides pretty well, where it kind of flows down. And granted, it looks it looks good like this, right? That looks like a normal pot. Well, I, I guess as normal as it can be. But it looks more ornamental, like this. I think the final thing we can do is take one of these little circle things and put it at the very top here so that we can round out all of these designs and tie them into the top somehow. And then I'll most likely kind of pat down the top as we go along. 
And it's weird because for the past hour I've been doing like this, like, does that look good? <laughs> or does that look good? <laughs> I've been really messing with this thing. That looks better. That looks far more artistic. This one little dot tied in the rest of it. I was even thinking about putting little dots here and here to tie in the rule of threes, but like, eh, we, we've done a lot of work already. So thank you, Dirty Potters, for joining me today. Join us for the next episode of this pot. We're gonna be glazing this thing. It's too big for me to dip it in a bucket, uh, but we are gonna bisque this, and the next time you see it, it's most likely gonna be glazed with one of my handmade glazes at Alpha Fired Arts because, because I do not have the space to spray this here or dip it in a bucket unless I want to do it real sloppy and it's easier for me to just drive down the street to Alpha and do it there than it is to do anything here and make a, I would have to make like a five gallon bucket of my own glaze that I want to glaze this in in order to do it. But thank you Dirty Potters for joining me today and I will see you next week. Thank you for your patronage.